Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you all today on this uh, Wednesday. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Jim Brumall, a professor over at uh, Shepherd University. Thanks for being with us today, Jim. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course, John. Always happy to help out and happy to do a program of Civil War Medicine. Uh, that, that's what we like to hear. So we're <laughs> Uh, this is going to be, a, a, I think, a really interesting conversation today, and it's a little bit different than uh, some of the programs we've done before, where in some ways this is sort of a, a work in progress talk, um, as opposed to talking about something that's already published. So uh, Jim is sort of working on these ideas almost in real time. Uh, yeah. you, you've done you've done a, a good bit of research already, uh, and you have a, a pretty good foundation. And so I'm um, really looking forward to our conversation today about um, sort of what happened to uh, Civil War bodies and, and early relic hunting on battlefields and the display of human bones. Uh, there's all kinds of wild, wacky and crazy things that we're gonna get into today. So uh, I hope you all enjoy and please jump in with questions uh, as, you, as you have them. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, and of course, always uh, chime in with where you're watching from. It's fun to see uh, where folks are tuning in from. We got Jan, of course, from Orlando. It's always good to have some of our regular uh, regular viewers tuning in. Of course, if you enjoy this or any of our videos, uh, consider hitting the like button, hit the share button, tell your friends about it, and uh, spread the word and, and share it with folks so that we can continue to increase our digital footprint. We really appreciate folks uh, doing that for us. And if you wanna take your support to the next level, um, our current fundraising campaign, we're working to raise some money um, to purchase two letters written by the famous Clara Barton uh, about her time living in the, uh, the space actually where I am right now. I'm at our Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum location. I just did a tour a little earlier today. And uh, the letters that we're trying to purchase and preserve and bring into our collection talk about her time living in the space upstairs and how she rearranged the room for the Missing Soldiers Office. So uh, you can find a link to that in the comments. Uh, please help uh, support us in that way and uh, we'd uh, really appreciate it. So let's see, quickly popping over the comments. We got people from Ellicott City, Maryland, Lakeland, Florida, uh, Pittsburgh. Um, let's see, oh, and uh, Paul from Pittsburgh said he enjoyed uh, a recent meeting of their Civil War Roundtable where oh, you yeah. spoke, Jim. Yeah, tell, hi, Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a good, good time, yeah, Western. Excellent. Uh, uh, Barbara from North Carolina, Tom from Denver, Pennsylvania, Adams County, Pennsylvania, Chickamauga, Georgia, New Orleans, Boston, all over the place. So uh, thanks for tuning in today, everyone. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so with that, uh, Jim, I, maybe if you could just, I, I, I like asking all our guests this before we get specific today. I wonder if maybe tell us a little bit about yourself for those who might not be familiar with you and, and what first kind of drew you to the Civil War era. Sure. I mean, I don't think I'm terribly unusual um, in that this has been a passion since childhood. Um, you know, my parents uh, were very good about taking me to national parks, antique stores, and cultivating um, my my love of books, which started pretty early on. And I was I was drawn to this you know this era um, primarily because of the landscapes. Uh, you know, I grew up in the the Mid Atlantic. Um, I spent a lot of time as as a youth at Antietam, um, Gettysburg, and it was those landscapes that compelled me. And increasingly, I became interested in the story of the common soldier, and then that in turn, um, you know, sort of blossomed into a broader interest in the 19th century um, more generally. And uh, I'm I'm interested in people. I'm a cultural historian. Um, I'm interested in how people sort of make sense of um, incredible events around them, how they process them, how they represent them, um, and so that that puts me down all sorts of pathways um, from primary source materials. I, I absolutely adore spending time in archives. And uh, if I had my druthers, I'd be in archives maybe all the time, um, but also to, to imagery, photographs, poetry. Um, and, and, and the Civil War era is just so incredibly rich in this, um, in this uh, just breadth of, of expressions and, and source materials. And it's really that material that started to define my career. And I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, I teach 19th century history at uh, Shepherd University, which is, if you haven't been there, 
in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, five miles south of Antian Battlefield, 12 miles from Harpers Ferry, 50 miles from Gettysburg. So I'm right in the heart of it. The area around us is very much a laboratory for our students. And we've cultivated really good relationships with folks like you and, of course, up at um, the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College and the national parks around us. And so um, what I started out as a childhood passion, fortunately, became a professional career. And um, as long as <laughs> I'm still able to do it, I'm going to do it probably um, for the, the rest of my days. And so, yeah. I love that. And I certainly admire the, the dedication to spending all the, the time in archives. Uh, if if you're really gonna be a historian, you you have to love that, and and you you certainly do. Yeah, and you know, for the, for the audiences, I just real quick, you know, I would I would encourage you if you can't get to the archives themselves and and feel and touch the primary source materials, we're fortunate in that there is just literally thousands of primary sources that have been printed. Um, University of South Carolina, University of Tennessee, especially Time Life, all these all these organs have just this massive amount of materials. And so I always encourage people to go to the source. That's the best way to understand this era. And then, of course, the historian's interpretations are vital, and you can read those or have read those. But sometimes it's those words that are going to spark uh, a new interest or, or take you down a really interesting pathway. Absolutely. That's where that's the the meat of it. And, and you know, people like you and I, Jim, we uh, have the benefit of, you know, like you said, trying to make some meaning of, of all of this. But yeah, for anyone, um, that's that's the best thing you can do um, is, is go to the go to the source. And uh, and as you were just saying, we live in a, a wonderful age where they're more accessible than, than they've ever been. But of course, some of the things you physically have to go <laughs> go and find them, which is the uh, um, I won't say it's the final frontier because it's really been the only frontier for a long time. <laughs> it's like the original frontier, I guess. <laughs> but uh, in any case, talking of research, uh, we're going to be talking about the work you've been doing uh, so far on you know, the early battlefield relic hunting collection and display of bones, what happens to Civil War bodies, really kind of gruesome stuff uh, in, in some cases. And I wonder if maybe you could uh, let folks know, first off, what got you started going down that that rabbit hole? Sure. And yeah, I mean, I guess as a disclaimer, um, the, the content, you know, will verge toward the graphic. I know this is lunch hour for a lot of people. Um, so, um, you know, I'll try to be sensitive, of course, um, but just to, to make everyone aware. Um, so, you know, the, the hook is really the, the, the famous man in his letter, right? Sullivan Ballou. Um, I'm sure your audience has seen uh, perhaps numerous times Ken Burns's The Civil War. And, you know, in the earliest of episodes, he um, has a letter which has been disputed as authenticity, um, but he he has a letter that is often attributed to Sullivan Ballou to his, his wife days before the Battle of Bull Run. And it's an incredibly mesmerizing, compelling scene um, and then we, of course, learn of Baloo's fate, and that is killed at the first battle of Bull Run. And I've encountered, I guess, two audiences. One audience seems to know this story well, and the other audience, which I was in that camp, has never heard of it. And so as I became interested in a broader project about battlefield relic hunting, um, the collection of artifacts from the field of battle, I started finding excerpts of an 1862 congressional report about the, you know, what they were portraying as the atrocities on the Bull Run or Manassas battlefield. And in particular, Ballou's name started to pop up time and time again. I thought, oh, that's odd. Ken Burns didn't certainly mention this story in his, um, you know, in his, his documentary. And, you know, this isn't going to be a, a, a knock on Burns because I think that documentary did incredible things for our profession and our field and the history that we love. But there are certainly moments when it tends to romanticize the conflict. And I think we as a society um, have done and continue to do that very much. But there are some truly grim episodes in this conflict. And it's important to remember that in many cases, you know, these enemies, although we often think of them later as sort of torn brothers or a conflict that is defined more by reconciliation or white reconciliation and reunion than by um, anger and, and hatred, there is a lot of hatred and anger between these two sides throughout the wartime era. And as Carrie Janey and other scholars have documented, it continues well into the post-war period. And so in this episode, as I'm, as I'm going through these newspaper reports, I start seeing 
these accusations that Georgia troops is what the, the newspapers um, uh, purport. Georgia's troops started to unearth um, Union dead, Union dead shortly after the battle. And in some cases, they sought to collect um, shin bones and arm bones that were, again, purportedly sawn into small sections and made into finger rings. And then in other cases, they started to take human skulls. And the, the human skull that uh, pops up time and time again in these accounts is that of our famed Rhode Island officer, Sullivan Ballou. Now, the supposition is that the Georgia soldiers were maybe trying to seek revenge uh, from the colonel of that regiment and instead found the body of Sullivan Ballou and used it in lieu of the commanding officer of that regiment. We're not entirely sure, but suffice it to say, the grave is fundamentally disturbed. His remains are later identified by Union officers, including um, Rhode Island, the Rhode Island governor, because of a distinct shirt that was thrown off to the bushes to the side, and the accounts of um, local enslaved and free African Americans, uh, as well as, I guess, loyal white Unionists in the area who sort of watched this unfold. And so Sullivan Ballou's body is, is removed from its grade, grave, and his head is ultimately taken as seemingly a trophy of war. And, and that in turn got me sort of down a really grim, dark rabbit hole as to whether or not this is an unusual um, feature of American life or of the Civil War. And I sort of started thinking back to my colonial history. And in fact, there are a couple of really prime documented instances when similar things have occurred. Um, during what is known as King Philip's War, the Wampanoag leader Metacom or King Philip is decapitated and his head is ultimately placed on display outside of Plymouth Colony. Um, in the early 19th century during the Seminole War, Osceola, the, the war leader, he uh, likewise loses his head and it sort of has a, a separate history from the rest of his body. And then for the Civil War era, I at first, and indeed have, have published a little bit about this, thought that this was an isolated incident, but I'm going to give a shout out to the Civil War Institute up at Gettysburg College. The first time I've ever really done anything publicly about this material was there, and that audience was primed for this discussion. And I was really grateful for the feedback, which included a whole series of similar incidents um, that I had never been aware of. And the two that I'll highlight uh, for the viewers before we go back to make some of the core content here is um, Lewis Powell, one of the Lincoln conspirators. His head is ultimately removed um, and, and taken as a trophy. And then the famed partisan bushwhacker William Quant uh, Quantrell, his head is removed from his body and has a separate life and is actually today buried in Dover, Ohio. And, and so while this one incident at Bull Run, which was beyond just Ballou's grave. There are many graves that are being disturbed by Confederate soldiers. And again, according to the articles by Georgians in particular, um, but there are several incidents that occur throughout the wartime era, at least of more famous figures having their heads like, like, likewise removed and then taken as trophies. And so that's sort of the basic contours of, of where I was going. And again, it was just a series of newspaper searches for relic, atrocity, and then um, ultimately the Liberator and the Christian re uh, Recorder, time and time again, were publishing huge sections of the report that Benjamin Wade had spearheaded um, this congressional investigation about this. And it in turn fueled, as we'll talk about later, cartoons um, and critiques of Southern society and, and more newspaper articles. And so this was an incredibly inflammatory event. And I think what's so remarkable to me as maybe an ill-informed historian, is that it suffers a fate of erasure. Again, there are certainly people who, who know about it. And when I mentioned, they're like, oh yeah, you didn't know that. But I think there are more people who don't know about this story. And instead, I think we're a bit more comfortable with the more romanticized depiction of Ballou's tragic but um, noble ending at Bull Run as captured so well in Ken Burns. But then there's this whole other story that we can unearth quite literally, um, about his remains and the fears that soldiers harbored and the atrocities that are sometimes committed on these battlefields and how this war spurs 
an incredible frenzy to collect quite literally millions of wartime objects that in some cases are macabre and they are human remains, but in other cases, more often than not, it's the material that were left over by the armies. And so that's, you know, sort of in brief, I guess, is, is what I started with and where I'm going. Yeah, what a what a fascinating story. And, and it certainly was unfamiliar to me. Um, I, I didn't realize what a, you know, like you, what a event, you know, that was and and the the controversy that arose as a result of it and investigations. I mean, that's that's pretty wild. And as you're going on and, and about how there's some sort of precedent for this as well, um, it makes me think of uh, Michael Sappel's book, Traffic of Dead Bodies, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is uh, a good read if you're into this sort of thing or, or into medical history, as I'm sure a number of folks watching are. Um, the, the whole idea that, um, that these are enemies, that they're kind of taking human remains of, um, and, you know, dissections where if doctors are doing them, it's sort of creepy, weird, and disturbing. You know, it's happening behind closed doors, and uh, sometimes local populations riot, you know, in response to these dissections. Um, but that there, there's a particular section in the book where um, Michael Sappel talks about how uh, dissections were sometimes like issued as like a, a judge's sentence, like a second death um, upon the death of a convicted criminal. And so I think it's notable that these are enemies that the, these people are kind of taking the, the relics from in all the cases you brought up. I think that's exactly right. And then, you know, in the pre-war examples I gave, they're often labeled as social others. Um, oftentimes across the, the plantation South, um, the, the heads of rebellious enslaved individuals are likewise mounted. Um, Jason Phillips documents that in his last book. I mean, and so, yeah, there has been this history of the sort of othering and, and, and by so doing desecrating the bodies. And I think it would be useful quickly, if I may, is that, um, can I share an image? Yeah, that, please go for it. And I think this is going to be a good sort of point counterpoint. Um, and so... I have a, um, does that, is that showing up, John? Yep. Yep. Okay. You know, the expectation going into the wartime era is steeped in this culture of sentimentalism and romanticism. Um, the garden or rural cemetery movement, um, has, has captivated middle and upper class Americans. So scenes like this are sort of the expectation, oftentimes, uh, funerary, uh, iconography is is steeped in the the, the weeping willow. Um, I, again, this culture of sort of romanticism, and you know, many people expect, and I hope that slide likewise progressed. Many people likewise expect, as Allison and Kurz capture in eight in their eighteen eighties lithographs, these romanticized heroic scenes of battle. Now. As many of your audiences probably know, Drew Faust does an absolutely incredible job in this Republic of Suffering of, of revealing how the, the good death is ultimately undone by um, the Civil War. And I think what so gripped me about this particular topic is, is how much soldiers began to fear, fear what would happen to their remains. Many are, are less concerned about the grisly wounds that they're most likely to sustain or the terrible diseases that would impact them for the rest of their life than they were of scenes like this. And in, in one particularly, um, I think, compelling letter, uh, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but a North Carolina soldier is writing to his mother talking about the, um, the Bull Run battlefield, and he sees a grave. It's been hastily covered over with dirt. Um, parts of what are becoming a decomposing body are protruding and worms are in, in, the, in, the, in the head. And he's absolutely horrified by this because again, I think so many Americans go into this conflict with a very specific idea about what's the good death, about what's a proper burial. And what they can't comprehend is the scale of carnage and the immediate crisis that all these battles start to produce. There are simply so many Americans being killed that these hasty anonymous graves become necessary they're not well marked. And then in this one horrific incident, th those 
already sort of liminal spaces are desecrated by the enemy. And so that uncovers and reveals all sorts of fears that Civil War soldiers harbored. And then they're seeing them get realized before their eyes. Yeah, that, that's such a fascinating angle to this that I hadn't even thought about it. And you preempted uh, Anna's question in the comments asking about how the Civil War slash Victorian view of the good death kind of mesh with, with this. So you, you you got that question covered there. And again, folks, please do um, type in your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, but that I think was such a notable point because of course, when at least when I think about the good death, I think about like the the moment of death, the, the act of dying, you know, surrounded by loved ones and, and all that sort of thing. But the, the kind of final piece of this is a proper burial and one that is to remain basically undisturbed for, you know, unless it's to go back to a family plot and how um, tenuous a lot of these civil war graves are, you know, grave robbing, bone stealing incidents aside, they're pretty, you know, you know, shallow graves, and you're left up to the, um, you know, the whether the burial party does a good job or not, or is, you know, feeling exhausted from all the work they've had to do so far. I mean, you're putting a lot of pretty weighty responsibility in the hands of, you know, some dudes um, who are who are doing some work. So that that's such an interesting distinction and aspect of the good death that I, I haven't given a lot of thought to, and how important it, it was. Well, and it cuts it cuts two ways. And so on the one hand, it's it's again, it's it's you know, creating these these fears in soldiers, and it's also just leaving a lot of families with unresolved questions, um, in that they're not going to probably be able to retrieve the bodies as they had done, you know, in the pre-war era with family deaths, deaths which often occurred within the home. I mean, bodies were often prepared, you know, within the domestic space. And then, as you noted, um, in many cases, uh, among rural families, the body most likely would be buried on on the family land. And so there would be this close proximity always. And so, you know, one of the problems that the war engenders is that there's just so many dead who are ultimately going to be unknown. And so many fates are more or less probably secured that they know their loved one died at the Battle of Antietam or the Battle of Gettysburg, but but the remains of the, the body are, are ultimately unknown. And so families will start finding ways to navigating the mourning process. And so sort of a side excursion, though I won't go too deep down, don't worry, um, is that you know there's this other phenomenon that's occurring during this period where there's just this huge traffic in items from the battlefield to the home front. Joan Cash and among others has, has documented this in great detail. And what I I'm trying to connect to this overall project isn't so much um, the souvenirs and the relics that the curious spectators are seeking, but rather is the intimate items associated with a loved one who's killed in the fight. And again, it's it's beyond, I think, our expectations. And it occurs in the war's first days um, with the death of Elmer Ellsworth. And Ellsworth does receive um, a, a proper burial according to the dictates of 19th century society, but in a very curious incident that becomes widespread, the family saves the frock coat in which she's shot and killed. It, it has a huge blasted hole in the um, left breast and the jacket was severely bloodstained. His Confederate counterpart, John Q. Marr, the very first Confederate officer killed in the American Civil War. His uniform is likewise saved. And so you see families putting this material culture in their parlors, in their front parlors, and using it to advance the mourning process in ways that I think, again, 19th century audiences were entirely unprepared for. And it has a lot to do with the unresolved nature of many of the wartime deaths and, and the fact that, again, so many men are being buried in these anonymous trenches. Yeah, and it's, it's almost watching them sort of make up new rules as they go along out of necessity, uh, essentially. That's exactly uh, right. Yeah, and, and it makes me think, too, of gives newfound importance to where I'm at, the, the missing soldier's office, the act of, you know, trying to... Um, 
physically locate, you know, precise locations. I mean, I, I can't, aside from obviously the large group of folks at Andersonville, I can't speak to how frequently Clara Barton identified specific locations, but at the very least battle specific battlefields and things of that nature. But yeah, there's just such an added weight and responsibility to a, a task like that. Well, and one more quick book reference, and the audience is probably already getting, getting tired of me uh, for doing this, but I apologize. I work in I work in books, um, and I want to get the the title correct here. Um, historian down at the um, University of Georgia, Stephen Barry, just uh, published a book based upon his Burroughs lectures at at Penn State, Count the Dead, and it's an incredibly fascinating book uh, that that goes back to antiquity and then moves into the modern era, but he has a very powerful middle section on the civil war and this, this duty, this obligation of starting to, to count as, as Barton did and her staff did count the dead and, and how that transforms the ways in which we think about conflict. And so again, Steve Barry count the dead is absolutely phenomenal. I read it in a day. I was so excited by it. Yes, and we're we're hoping to have him on as well to uh, to talk about that. So uh, get excited for whenever that happens. We'll we'll get there eventually. Um, one other uh, question from the audience for I want to start to touch on what happens to these skulls and artifacts once they're they're taken. Um, but Jan asked an interesting question um, about the practice of battlefield embalming, and you know. Uh, if part of the, the job of embalming, if the embalming surgeons, you know, physically identified and dug up graves and, and maybe how embalming fits into this story or, or if you've gone that far yet. I haven't, and you'll probably be more knowledgeable about this than I am. Um, I mean, you know, my understanding is, of course, there's, there's a price attached to embalming and there's a price attached to the transportation of the dead. And so for, for wealthy elites, they often make incredible they take incredible strides to ensure that um, their soldiers are embalmed, transported, and properly buried. Um, and, and so I'm sure that certainly ties into this overall concern about the, the fate and the burial of the dead. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., of course, is famously wounded at the Battle of Antietam. Um, we're doing a conference in about two weeks' time with Antietam, and um, my section's on survival. And so I went back to Holmes Sr.'s famous account, Hunt uh, for the, ca the Captain. And it's amazing that he's gained the, the news by telegraph on the day of the battle. And because he's a man of means, he's making his way down from Massachusetts to Maryland within days of the battle. And, and, and so, you know, this is very much skewed by, by class. And Ballou certainly comes from a wealthy background. But I guess I'd urge the audience to remember that there are literally tens of thousands of families that have no means. Um, to, to embalm, to, to find, or to bury the dead. Um, they, they ultimately, their fate is going to be left to the armies that are victorious on the battlefield. Um, and so what then happens, and I'll, I'll go back to Faust's book, is that we more broadly, at least in the United States as a society, decide that national cemeteries are going to be the best means of honoring those wartime dead, of consecrating these battlefields, which heretofore, Visitors to them were often critiqued in both Europe and the United States. That's a, that's an odd pastime, yet hundreds of people are coming to these battlefields right after the, the guns have stopped firing. Um, and, and, and so I think that has something to do with the lack of resolution, because when you go to those national cemeteries, which are incredibly powerful places, it's really, to me at least, the, one of the most gripping things is just all those unknowns, unknowns, unknowns. And, and so it's, it's some means, I think, of closure. But I'll defer to you if you want to talk more about embalming, because again, you all are the experts in that arena, but it's a it's an excellent point and I'll certainly pursue it further. Yeah, well, I, not too much to add uh, other than my understanding, and I'm prepared to be wrong about this, is that most of the embalmings that happened, there were embalming surgeons that would basically follow the armies mm -hmm. and that they would identify bodies before they're in, before they're in the ground. Um, so I, I don't know how much digging up is being done by embalming surgeons. I, I don't think lots. Well, and, and the problem is, and again, I, I don't want to be gross. I mean, but the, the decomposition rate is occurring incredibly quickly. Um, and, and so that's just something to be mindful of. If And again, I'm not going to go into de detail here, but you know, read um, a book like Greg Coco's A Strange and Blighted Land that's just filled with accounts of the, the post-battle Gettysburg battlefield. Look at the images of Gardner and Brady 
and you can immediately get a sense of what those bodies, how those bodies are transforming because of heat and because of sun. And so it, it has to, as someone who's not versed in medicine at all, I believe it has to occur incredibly quickly after the death. And again, it's very much skewed by class and then by just ability. You know, there's only so many embalming surgeons working, but it does become a big business. And again, Faust has, a, I think, an entire chapter on it in um, uh, This Republic of Suffering. But yeah, it's a, it's a good, good point. Absolutely. Um, let's go ahead and touch on um, what happens to these bones and, and things once they are removed from the battlefield. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, sometimes they, they would become rings and such, which is you know, fairly disturbing. Uh, you, you sent along a great image um, to, that we used to sort of promote the program, and this might be a good time to, to bring this in. Um, but yeah, what, what happens to these? Who's displaying them? What, just speak to that if you would sure and this has been one of the more frustrating aspects of the research which which happens and so um you know as i'm working through this i started talking to friends and you know that's the nice thing about our community everyone's incredibly friendly and generous and you know i just started asking people who knew sources really well have you read other accounts of soldiers unearthing the dead? Have you read accounts of any sort of human remains being displayed? And um, I'll get to the image here in a second, I promise. And I didn't get back too much. Um, there is a reference in the 1864 Metropolitan Fair catalog. This was a big fundraising effort that took place in New York City. And one of the items listed in that catalog is of a skull that have been used as a, you know, quote unquote, wine goblet. Um, one of the soldiers in the accounts that were being released in the northern newspapers and related in the congressional investigation said that ultimately he was taking a skull that he was going to transform into a cup that he was going to use to toast his new bride at their wedding. Now, you know, again, this is sort of down the line, not from the man's mouth. Um, there are scattered accounts that I did get back of people making references to, to skulls or to um, human uh, bone rings being worn and found in camp. My suspicion is that it was ultimately rather unusual, despite, you know, the, the frenzy that this episode, and again, Baloo is not the only one. There are, are numerous bodies that are being disturbed um, shortly after the Battle of uh, Bull Run. And um, that in turn is being sort of discovered uh, by white Northerners and then local black and white audiences throughout the fall, winter, and then eventually um, when the Confederates retreats in the, in the spring of 62. Um, but the episode itself becomes fodder. And I had seen this image before and I had sort of forgotten about it. <laughs> And uh, Angela Elder, I'm not sure if you've had Angela on. Okay, Angela's a fabulous scholar and her new book, um, Love and Duty is just exquisite, but she she had it in there. I was like, oh, and I, you know, I, I, I totally forgotten about it. And this image, uh, you know, appears in Frank Leslie's and Frank Leslie's for, for viewers, a lot of Frank Leslie's um, illustrated newspaper can be found online. And Frank Leslie's in my, in my view, is is offers some of the more realistic images of the conflict, um, especially the coverage of the Battle of Antietam, which I've been delving into really deeply for um, a presentation and for this book, um, are horrific and compelling and portray the war in ways that Harper's Weekly was often unwilling to do. Now, I will have a Harper's Weekly image here in a second, but this image, uh, which is a cartoon, this isn't based upon any sort of factual, um, southern parlor but it, it, it what it does in profound ways is it transforms this sacred space into the profane this is the heart of domesticity this is supposed to be a middle class white southern woman um she's supposed to be attending the child at her footsteps who is instead playing with a skull she herself is drinking tea from a skull and she is encased, quite literally, with human remains. 
And they quote this letter, which again is fabricated. My dearest wife, I hope you have received all the little relics I have sent you from time to time. I am about to add something to your collection, which I feel will surely please you. A baby rattle for a little pet made out of the ribs of a Yankee drummer boy. Uh, so this is a sensationalized image. It's incredibly inflammatory, but it also, I think, spurs this ne next image, which appears in Harper's Weekly. And this, um, you know, again, is a fabricated incident, but what they claim is that a, um, a transport was captured en route, uh, I believe, to London. And as they're uh, going through the contents of the vessel, they find this incredibly um, dark assortment of items, including a goblet made from a Yankee skull, which could have been in reference to the quotes that the Georgia soldier supposedly um, offered to a, a, a bystander as they were unearthing these graves a paperweight made from a Yankee jawbone, a reading desk formed from both whale skeleton and one of Lincoln's hired minions, furs formed of scalps and beards, a bell handle, uh, a almost Jefferson Davis looking like figure, a head wreath of ditto, necklace of Yankee teeth. Um, and so, you know, this is absolutely horrific and captured this incident clearly captured the minds and imaginations of, of northern audiences and again sort of in, in, engenders fears but also starts to raise animosities you know how many acts of reprisal are going to be committed on the battlefield because of a series of images that circulates in 1862 or because of a series of newspaper articles that are, are reprinted over the course of 1862. And you know, this is a point in the conflict where we're well into the, the, the second year, Shiloh, Antietam either have occurred or will occur depending upon the day of publication that we're talking about the summer and the fall of 1862. And the war is just escalating in pretty horrific ways. And then all of this sort of floods the market, this, this propaganda. And so one of the things that I can't find any sort of direct evidence to suggest, but one would suppose that again, it might escalate incidents of violence and it might spur acts of reprisal. Um, but the other part of this, which I'm really curious about, I've just found nothing really on, you know, and it's a really delicate question for museums because museums often inherit collections, museum curators and inherit collections that started in the 18th and 19th centuries, some of which have human remains. And um, it's it's an ethical question that museum curators are dealing with, but I've I've often wondered, are there small or historical societies or smaller ones private now public museums that might have back in the collections some of these potential battlefield remains? I, I don't know that. We know, of course, about the more public um, scientific specimens and, and, and things of that nature, which are found in Silver Springs and, and Bethesda and you know, the museums that proliferate around DC during the wartime era and are still around today. But you know the fate of some of this stuff, I simply don't know. I don't know if it was cast off during the wartime era in the post-war period, but the incident and its reporting certainly spurred among the Northern press a whole stream of propaganda that said this stuff is all over Southern households. You know, this is the corruption of, of, of Southern women and Southern children. And these are the monstrosities that are being committed by Confederate soldiers on the battlefield. Yeah, that time frame of 1862 is a really interesting one as well, because that's the same time frame the, as you're just alluding to, the Army Medical Museum comes into being, and specifically the collection of human remains, uh, in this case for scientific study, but it's, it, I talk about the Army Medical Museum as sort of ultimately an attempt at sort of a good PR strategy on the, behar on the behalf of uh, um, you know, doctors in the 19th century because they're regarded with suspicion because when their people are thinking about dissections, this is exactly what they are imagining that this is in some ways trophy hunting as opposed to for the purpose of education. And the whole thrust of the Army Medical Museum is, you know, and uh, Dr. John Brinton, who's the first curator of, of the Army Medical Museum, he has a 
some, you know, pretty intense encounters with Civil War surgeons who are a little hesitant um, to, uh, uh, you know, submit these remains. He, he in, in one instance, he digs up you know, a limb pit and dramatically dumps it out in the middle of a field hospital. And he says something to the effect of, you know, what good uh, are these limbs doing in the ground? We can't learn from them. Um, so it like, the, my point is it's sort of a whole attempt to distance the medical community from kind of images like you were just showing. And so I think it's an interesting counterpoint. I mean, it's a little bit off the, the path of kind of the avenue that you're, you're headed down. But the fact that that is also beginning literally at the exact same time that those images you just showed are beginning to pro proliferate. Uh, the the synchronicity of it is curious. Um, so there's that. And then to your point, uh, your other question about museums that might have actual of these items. The only thing that that we have that sort of fits in this realm. These aren't. I'm not even certain if they're human bones or not. I believe it's an object that's on loan to us from the collection of a surgeon, John Wooden, I believe is the gentleman's name, a surgeon from an Indiana regiment who gets captured at the Battle of Chickamauga. Mm -hmm. And he's sent to Libby Prison uh, when it's all said and done. And uh, while there, he carves bone rings um, out of some sort of bone. Uh, I believe it's animal bone. Animal, but the, yeah. He has a bone whistle and then a, a bone ring. Um, not the same thing exactly, but he but he does send them home to his family. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there there is a really big trade um, in those items produced at prisons. I think in almost all cases, though, it is animal bone. Um, so it's a little more palatable to, to 19th century audiences. Again, it's probably not quite what we would do today. Um, but, you know, these are the same audiences that um, often made uh, birches and wreaths out of human hair. Um, you know, hair jewelry was incredibly common among middle and upper class families. It was a important way of remembrance that began the late 18th century and continued well into the post-Civil War era. Again, it doesn't gel with our sensibilities, but it was it was quite commonplace in that period. Um, the past is a foreign country. And so, um, yeah. Right. Um, so, we have that one kind of recorded instance where we we know something like this happened with Sullivan Ballou and you know things after the the first Bull Run battlefield, and it causes obviously un understandably quite a stir. Do we have any other kind of recorded instances of this happening? Because obviously, as you said, it whips people up into a frenzy. Um, but does that kind of you know taper away as time goes on and you know? their lack of recorded instances of this and people say, well, maybe this isn't as big a deal as we thought it was, or are there others? Yeah, um, I'm gonna show a really famous image. It's John Rickey's, um 1865 Cold Harbor. And um, what's happening is the the disinterring and reinterring um, of the dead. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, I think this, this image was often used um, again in sort of a similar vein. And in fact, it's, um, it pops up in the the Gardner uh, sketchbook, and and basically, um, in it he uses the image to critique, um, and it's, it's not a, it's not a really accurate uh, description of what's going on here, but he uses it to critique um, white Southerners' indifference to the dead, um, and so it was one of the more I guess um, notable accounts that I found again published just after the war uses a critique of, of white Southerners and um, their unwillingness to treat the Union dead as they had treated their own. And um, again, Gardner, he was a social activist. He did a lot of really good work. Um, but I think in this instance, in terms of the, the historical accuracy, he misses the mark. And maybe in terms of the broader critique, um, he's, he's, he's a bit right. Um, but no, I mean, I, you know, I, I actively searched. Um, and again, what's kind of come out from subsequent discussions, including, again, I'm very grateful to the folks at CWI, um, are these one-offs, uh, for lack of a better phrase, you know, Lewis Powell, William Quantrell, um, uh, you know, just, just specific incidents. Um, I just haven't seen, and again, maybe some of your viewers will be frantically typing in, like, you need to read this, um, but I just haven't seen it occur in the same way. And I have a couple of different ideas about this. Um, there's an interesting account in Far, Far From Home, which is one of those really good printed primary sources, is the letters of Dick and Tally Simpson, 3rd South Carolina, 
Um, Dick is discharged because of dysentery. Tally is killed at the Battle of Chickamauga. But in the, the summer of 61, Dick is riding home to one of their sisters. And he's saying, you know, everyone's sort of forecasting the war is about to end. I'm frantically getting any sort of artifacts that I can. If you want, I'll find some human bones for you. I'll find some Yankee bones. He, he, he writes that to his, to his sister, <laughs> really matter of fact. Like, yeah, I'll get you a, a bayonet, a button, and a bone. And I think in, in that summer of 61, you know, it's a 90-day conflict, right? It's a 90-day war. The big battle has occurred and everyone is frantic to get some, some piece of it. Um, in some cases, quite literally human remains and in other cases of a vanquished enemy and other cases, just the, materi uh, the material from the battlefield. And so I think one of the reasons why it does occur when it occurs is, is because there was this idea that this was the big fight. I'm not saying it's ethical, I'm not saying it's moralistic or justifiable, but my, my hunch is the Confederates were frantic to get some sort of documentation that this is where they ultimately achieved, you know, white Southern independence. This is where the war was won. And, and, they, and that they were there, you know. Yep, yeah, and th they were there. And, and, you know, what I have found and the threads them going down in the in the broader book, and I alluded to briefly, is that instead the collection of human remains more or less stops, but the collection of artifacts from bullets that pierced wood to bloodied uniforms to to bullet shot Bibles to accoutrements thrown off on the battlefield, there are a, a cash in sight. You know, millions of these things that that are collected, and and that to me connects to this story of of both Northerners and Southerners, black and white, veteran and citizen, desperately wanting some piece of material culture to connect them to this conflict. And you know the, the extent is so notable that today, um, what is now the American Civil War Museum, um, the Confederate Relic Museum, um, parts of the collections in DC and New York, huge parts of those collections, Gettysburg, Gettysburg National Parks Museum collection, are all predicated upon this massive collection of wartime artifacts. And what typically happens, which is another interesting story, perhaps for another book, is that within a generation or two, though, families seem to lose interest. And so the wartime generation collects and displays the items but it's just as likely between the 1880s and the 1920s that the families are going to simply say, oh, this is old dusty stuff, get it out of my house. And it'll become deposited in a whole host of these institutions that are today, you know, really some of the biggest museums of the Civil War era or have some of the biggest collections of Civil War artifacts in the Western, in the world, not even the Western hemisphere. Um, and so there's something else I think going on there, which I think connects to a broader impulse among one or two generations removed to sort of, you know, start to suppress some of the wartime traumas and and, and the war, the, the unresolved nature of the conflict and um, move on in some cases to New South boosterism or, um, you know, the promise of the Gilded Age or whatever it is. Um, although there is a, a vibrant marketplace for um, Civil War memory, certainly in the, in the, in the Gilded Age as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting narrative arc as well that there's this, this one moment and it doesn't seem to last very long but i i again to 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 date and i'm you know, this ongoing project i haven't found a lot of other references to this yeah actually uh, uh i'm recalling an instance uh in the early days of the war also in 1861 uh at harper's ferry uh october of 1861 there's a very small skirmish on Bolivar Heights, um, not tons of casualties. I mean, probably less than 50 combined, um, but that there are accounts and and uh, my old coworkers at Harper's Ferry would be mad at me. I can't remember who supposedly did the mutilating. I don't think anyone was decapitated or anything like that, but bodies were sort of mutilated and sort of pinned up on trees or something like that, a pretty grisly episode. Yeah, and and I think and yeah, that's another avenue, um, which again we'll probably not get into today. But mutilation of the dead is another sort of story, mm -hmm. and, and there are more documentable instances of that. Battlefield atrocities being committed against black soldiers. I mean, there's certainly documentable instances. It's the sort of removal of the heads that is so unusual. Um, right. You know, the the bodies were quite literally boiled. 
um, you know, to extract the bones. It was a very deliberate, methodical process. The clothing was often either burned or put into bushes to hide. They were deliberately trying to collect these bones as though they're processing an animal as they had done you know, countless times on, on farms in the pre-war era. And so that's what marks this is so sort of unusual, is this very methodical, very calculated, very deliberate. Fascinating. Yeah, well, that yeah, that is a notable distinction. Um, interesting question in the comments. Uh, you know, a lot of the kind of press about this were Northern publications, you know, accusing Southerners. Was there any, were the roles reversed? I mean, you know, documented instances of this actually happening or not. Did the Southern press ever, you know, accuse Northern soldiers of doing something like this? Yeah, this came up in the Q&A um, at CWI too. It's, it's a great question. And, you know, it, it, there's a couple of layers to it because the first is, of course, the argument can be made that this was simply a propaganda piece. Um, now, again, there's there's a lot of eyewitnesses that sort of bear out the story. They vary. In some cases, they're white unionists. In other cases, they're enslaved African-Americans. There are scattered Confederate accounts bemoaning the fact that people are doing this. They, they themselves are watching it. Um, and, and, and now it does get escalated and elevated in the press. Um, but I never found any Southern retractions where Southern newspapers are saying, no, this never happened, nor did I find a lot of, um, counter arguments that this was being done to their debt. And, and, and so again, no, it, it's, and I haven't exhaustively read, you know, all wartime newspapers, of course, but that's again what's so odd about this is i just i'm no i i didn't and um you know i deliberately did kind of search out some of that stuff i will say it's you know in this day and age a lot of newspapers are digitized and so when i go to archives i'm really interested in unpublished letters and diaries and there are treasure troves and you find all sorts of random stuff that you have to dig for and when you find it it's explosive Newspapers, a lot of them are online and a lot of them are searchable. So, you know, I've tried a whole host of different sort of um, ways to work the search engines. And again, it just hasn't revealed much. And that's not to say I've done a totally exhaustive newspaper search. Um, but, you know, I've tapped some of the bigger databases, either subscribe as a subscriber or just the ones that are public. And it's just not coming up as, as counter accusations or as um, apologies or as retractions. I just don't see it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, more to come on that potentially, or maybe not. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, as we're kind of coming to the end of our, our time here, I think this might be a good question to end with from Anna. Um, do you feel like our current fascination with some of the more gruesome tales from the Civil War are kind of an offshoot of relic collecting? Um, certainly at the uh, for us at the museum, I mean, some of our articles and posts that, you know, tend to do well. Um, one of the most viewed pages on our website is about facial reconstructive surgery, just the fascination with the, the grim and because the, the pictures are pretty gruesome there as well. So just, yeah, I'm just curious for your thoughts on that. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, and, and I guess I'll start with a totally different story. I was um, driving out to, to Delaware, and uh, I was listening to an NPR story about someone who spent his career doing cold cases, um, and and he helped solve some of the more horrific um, serial, unresolved uh, murders of serial killers in the late 20th, early 21st centuries, and, and he goes to these things called like crime cons, where people are really interested in serial killers, and one of his big, I think, obligations, he said, is, is to the, the victims and the families that survived and to, to sort of humanize. So on the one hand, you know, he goes and he speaks, so he clearly sort of enables. On the other hand, he wants to remind audiences that, you know, he has spent countless hours with families who've suffered because of this. Um, and so I think with all this, we, we, we kind of walk a, a tight rope, right? Um, you know, the wartime dead uh, didn't have any choice in being photographed. They were just photographed and those photographs are being reproduced. Um, that's something we won't, we don't do uh, in a modern wartime environment, at least among United States soldiers. Um, I think, and again, someone could correct me, I think Vietnam was probably one of the last times we had a lot of more uncensored photographs. Um, so there's, there's a certain delicacy that I try to be cognizant of and honor. Um, you know, we're reading lots of source materials by people who never thought other people would read them. 
other than their intimate families. Yeah. And so there's, again, this sort of obligation that I sometimes feel and almost like I shudder at, at, at what I'm doing. Um, but on the sort of broader notes, a happier note maybe, um, there's, there's just an intense interest in material culture, the relics and the artifacts of the wartime era. And it's because I think, and you know, I've dabbled in collecting throughout my life and I've sold it and gotten us other stuff. And now I just deal with books, but it's like, there's something about touching the tangibles or for me walking on the battlefield that connects people to these stories in really profound ways. And that is transcendent. That was true during the wartime era when again, all sorts of Americans from all sorts of walks of life were actively collecting stuff associated from this, this huge conflict that fundamentally reshaped their society. And that interest has continued into the present day. I think in the best instances, these collections ultimately form the underpinnings of museums where interpretation and education is allowed. Um, and in other cases, you know, people like relic hunters when paired with archeologists can be incredibly productive and incredibly useful in documenting heretofore unknown sites. Um, but I think it's that that materiality, that 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 tangibility, that really compels people. Though with all of this, you know, I just always sort of caution that I think we have to be respectful and mindful of you know the the that we're dealing with past, you know, human actors, and 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 they don't have a lot of say in in ultimately how their stories are being told. And so I'm not sure if that exactly addresses the question, but at least that's my sort of um, that's my my response. Yeah, well, I I think it. It touches on the idea that there is sort of obviously there was a fascination at the time with relic collecting you know whether it's human remains or more commonly material culture you know objects and things and the those i think you could argue were collected in the first place because there was maybe a sense that people would be interested in you know the stories that might be associated with them and here we are 160 years later really interested in those stories and what i think you were saying so eloquently is that it it, it would be well for us to remember that um especially the more you know gruesome relics of all these you know their human lives and, and things attached to all this and it's important to remember and, and it's a tightrope that we walk at a medical museum all the time even though we have very few human remains that we display and uh, really only one in our collection um, at all um, you know it's, it's something that we're cognizant of as we're sharing stories of those who you know suffered intently uh, going through the the medical system so I think it's something important to remember and, and be aware of and I, that's probably a, a great place to to draw this to a close here and um, I'll add too for folks that you know enjoyed today's program. Um, there'll be more to come on this. So I'm sure we'll have you back on, Jim, in uh, a year, two, three, four, or whenever. <laughs> um, there's oh, there, yeah. there, there's more to, and maybe maybe Jim doesn't want to think that far in the future. <laughs> um, but uh, no, no, living each day as they as they, they as they come. But no, I mean sincerely, thank you to the audience. Um, uh, I I don't have up any. Facebook or means to engage because it's just, I don't have the um, ability to do two things at once, but, um, you know, thank you all sincerely for tuning in during your lunch hour or break um, in the middle of the day. And thank you to John and all my friends over at Savor Medicine. For those of you who haven't been, they have three sites. I would strongly encourage you to go. And again, it's the materiality that often conveys the stories in the most compelling ways. Um, and they've certainly been very good partners to me. We have a temporary exhibit up right now at the Savor Center um, at Shepherd um, that they've generously let us borrow. And so I always enjoy seeing you, John, especially at CWI, but we can do it virtually as well. So thank exactly. you. Exactly. So um, there'll be more to come eventually from Jim on this, I'm sure, uh, one day. And and uh, we'll have him back at that point. And who knows, probably more times uh, between now and then. Um, but thank you, everyone, for tuning in. As Jim said, really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the program, hit the like button, hit the share button. Uh, tell folks who you think might be interested uh, in this. Help us grow our digital footprint. And if you want to take your support to the next level, uh, there should be a pinned uh, comment pinned link in the comments. We're uh, trying to bring more artifacts into our collection, letters written by Clara Barton about her time uh, at the missing soldier's office. So uh, that's a great way to support us if you've enjoyed our programming uh, throughout the, the several years we've been doing it here. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. And uh, with all that said, this is John and Jim signing off. <laughs>